Should I talk to Emma? Okay, can you... Yeah, you're reading well. That's a okay, good test. Yeah. Okay, very so good. So I just we need you to tell me your name and, okay. um, and, and we'll start from that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, bonjour, I was born Yolande Rachel Lefebvre and later married and the last name now is Nick Nair. So, um, my father and mother were Simone Michaud and René Lefebvre and both of them lived in a very small village, not a village, really a small city in Canada, uh, Saint-Jean d'Iberville today known as saint jean sur richelieu in the province of Quebec. My father's family were old uh, established family for a couple of hundred years in that particular area, whereas on my mother's side, they were somewhat newly is settled. And uh, what was your father, what was your father's side of the family established in? For a hundred years, you're saying they were an established family. Uh, Is there a business that they're established in? Yeah, my my grandfather, uh, my father's father, Rodolphe Lefebvre, was a miller, and my actually his wife was a payette, and the payette were very powerful, and particularly in politics and uh, the um, running of this uh, the village, and uh, so. One was, like I said, was a newspaper person and a clothing store, uh, also a hardware store, and they were quite influential. And at one time, my grandfather used to be what they call uh, maîtrisé de l'éducation, uh, which is a, uh, I would say, probably something like a, a school board. And uh, so, but on my mother's side, they were primarily. They came in from the northern part of Canada uh, after being there for about 10 years. Previously, they had been living in Manchester, New Hampshire, where both my grandmother, uh, Donalda, and my grandfather, Adela, uh, worked in the uh, Abbasquick Mills of Manchester, New Hampshire at the turn of the century. They were married in Manchester. and had four children. My mother, uh, Simone, was the second one. She had an older sister, um, Yvette, and then a third sister that came after my mother, which was Lucille, and the last after that was Matante Rita. And by that time, both my grandparents and my grandfather's brothers, Adela's brothers, decided to go back to Canada to reclaim some terror to buy in and to go back to Canada to, to make a new living. And the main reason for that is that after World War I, the area, particularly around Manchester, had been, um, uh, there was a very serious influenza and thousands of people had died. So they wanted something more hardy and helpful for their children. And why they went to Northern Ontario was always a mystery to me. But um, in doing a little research, I did find out that uh, there were territories that were offered uh, at a very, uh, pieces of land, I'm sorry, uh, offered in the, this, this particular part of the country in Ontario, Northern Bega, and uh, so they decided to pack up everything and get on the train, and they drove, maybe they rode about a thousand miles, and uh, they settled there and eventually did settle in Norembega. And so my mother used to talk a lot about these early days. It was kind of a pretty rugged and the land was not as good as they had claimed. So by the time my mother was 14 and her sister was 15, my grandmother Donaldo felt that they should come back or return to the United States and it would be more uh, a better life for her daughters. And so, which she did. So she had friends who had migrated back and were right on the, but when they came to the border, they found out that the laws had changed and they needed to have some papers and have to go to Montreal and get uh, new uh, pass passports, which were not existent at the time when they had moved 
to Canada. So the story is that my grandmother uh, with my mother, her sister, and the two younger children uh, and they left my grandfather with the rest of the family and uh, moved to, uh, to St. Jean where her friends were living until to see what uh, what they could, if they could get those papers and see if they were able to uh, um, to see if they'd be better going back to Canada or staying where they are. But my grandmother did find out that this was not a bad town, Saint Jean, and so she informed my grandfather, and he later came to Saint Jean, and it was there that uh, my grandpapa or my grandfather uh, did all work for my other grandfather. Uh, Rodolf at his mill. And this was probably the first introduction where the Lefebvre and the Michaud were got to know each other. And it was also known at the time that the prettiest girl in town were the Michaud girls. And so eventually my father did meet my mother and they were married. And, uh, and out of this union, here I am. I had another younger brother that came about a year later and his name was uh, Jules Rodolphe, after my grandfather Rafael. Uh, but sadly, he died within 11 months. And I'm not sure exactly of what he died, but it was said, uh, spell, and I have absolutely no idea what that means. I did try to find out, and I haven't been able to. And, uh, and it wasn't until about seven years later that my other brother, that I call my older brother, Michael, was born. And um, then five years after Michael, my the baby of the family was Alan. And uh, so there is quite a difference in age. Uh, What's the difference in age? Well, between Alan and myself, it's 12 years. And Michael and I, it's seven years. So, so they always kind of consider me like their second mother. But I was the kind of a kid that your mother would say, do this, and I would do it. So I didn't question it, just did it. Now, now what was the reasoning for you being the quote-unquote second, second mother? Because a girl always assumed that responsibility. The oldest of a family, she always took on that responsibility. And uh, so it was very normal, for, particularly for large families. The oldest one would take on that role as a mother's helper everywhere they could. And your role became greater after your father? Um, well, my father was, well, it was quite a few years after. It was about 16 years later that my mother did uh, decided to leave uh, my father. Um, but it was always there because of the difference in age, I think. That was the whole thing. And so, um, so as a child, I was the only grand, yeah, I was the only granddaughter on my father's side, oh my God, I don't know far about, until Michael came. And then on my mother's side, it was basically the same thing, until my Auntie Beth got married. And then Muriel and I are about, my, which is uh, my Auntie Beth's daughter, Muriel, is uh, about four or five years younger than I am. So, but I was very spoiled on the LFA side. How do you mean spoiled? Oh, I would go down to their house and uh, I would always, my mother would say, never, never ask for, for, for food or anything, or beg for food particularly. And so I would never ask, and I said, do you have uh, the Vimo Sudgatu, an old, an old piece of cake? And it was amazing, they always had an old, old piece of cake for me. And so that was okay, so I wasn't begging. They were just getting rid of old cake. <laughs> you got and a lot of cake, huh? I got a lot of cake and a lot of attention. <laughs> and my aunts used to let me play with their clothes. And I would dress up all over the place, and uh, so it was a it was a very happy home in those days. Uh, my grandfather was a very kind man, and not a um, a kind of a man who just quiet, unassuming. Um, no, not much of a not very much ambition. Just happy to be what he was. He would have been a great farmer, and with his animals. And, uh, but he lived at a time uh, when, like in the end of the 30s, it was the World War II started. And by the time World War II, 
ended, uh, everything got industrialized. And the one thing he did not do is uh, uh, industrialize the mill. And his idea was, says, well, what's good enough for my father is good enough for me. And uh, so, but my father was always designated, he was the oldest boy in the family, he was designated that he would inherit his father business, but um, he would not give my father the business to run it. So my father has to work for him. Um, one of the big problems with my dad is that uh, he did, he was, uh, went to a private school and that uh, started his education. I think he went in probably his first year of what we could call today uh, college. Um, but his father needed him at the mill and asked him to come home. And so he did, and then later met my mother and got married. Um, so he was a hard worker. And the work was a lot of physical, a lot of physical work. Uh, and they would grind them. All the farmers in the, uh, in the neighborhood would bring their wheat, their belief, their farine, and they would make uh, flour. Um, other kinds of flowers, I, which I can't think of right now, and um, and they would blend it, and they would all come. And on Saturday, the wives would go to the markets and do a little shopping, outdoor markets, and the men would come to my grandfather's place and wait until it was time for them to pick up their their wheat if they if it was ready. If not, uh, just to pass the day, and it was. Particularly in the winter was most interesting because I used to spend a lot of time there. I would go down and play and I would jump around on the bale of flowers or grain and I, cause I loved it. And uh, it was kind of fun. I'd listen. I, I was a great listener. I wasn't a talker, but I was a great listener. And some of the tales were really something. Oh yeah, what was the most, yeah. what was the most, what was the most grandiose tale that was told to you that you can remember? Well, the tales was, now you have to remember the time I remember that particular time. I was about seven years old when World War II, it was 1942, I was about seven. Uh, and the, the, the Allies weren't doing that well at the time because the Germans were um, really, uh, were very far, and I think, oh yeah, I think I remember now, uh, France had just fallen um, and the, the, the healing Maréchal uh, which was supposed to protect France, was invaded by the German. And so uh, France was uh, taken over by the Germans. So everybody was talking about that. And the only resistance that they had was from Germany, I'm sorry, from Britain, and, uh, and then the help of the Americans. So the men would sit around in the winter. My grandfather had a big, huge pot belly stove. And... Um, with wood and all that, and everybody would sit around it, and they would always pass around a little bottle of uh, Caddy Boo, which is homemade brew, very, very strong. And uh, then they would discuss the war, what they would do, and what they would do, and what he should do, and what he should do. So it was just really something. But what I kind of like this, they would also, and everybody would say, oh no, my, my Caddy Boo is better than yours. No, no, mine is better. And so they would, I remember one time, they said, oh no, mine is it's, it's better than yours. It, it's really 100% proof. And they took a spoon one day and put a, uh, fill it up with uh, the caddy boo, uh, liquor, and put a match underneath, and it just, uh, it just disappeared. So you can tell how powerful it was. So they came in a little sober and left a little uh, right on their way. Uh, but just some of the fun things we used to do. And, uh, but, uh, so um, at the mill, my father would do, you know, run the mill to grind the uh, um, the various um, libli that they had, and uh, also he had a little business where they would make mattresses. And in the uh, in, in one other place that they had uh, in the back room, in the back of the mill, uh, they had the farmers would bring their skins, and my father would salt it, and um, and cure them, and they would sell them, and also they had, uh, uh, on the second floor, they would um, make furniture. My father also used to make furniture. So they were kind of um, a little 
industri a little industry in, the, in themselves. But a lot of it was done by la I mean, just, just manual labor. And uh, that is what happened. Uh, there were other people who did that, but after the war, uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Sullivan. No, not Sullivan. It was a little a Jewish family, Silverman. And he mechanized. And of course, he did much, much better. And he had a truck that he could, you know, deliver his stuff. My father still had the old horse and buggy. So that's one thing my father had a very hard time with. He would have liked to have a truck to deliver. But my grandfather says, we don't need that. We don't need that. So, and uh, my grandfather died when he was in probably uh, in the late, I think it was in the late 50. No, no, I'm sorry. The late 40s. It was 1950. When his youngest daughter... Okay, Mo, be careful about putting your hand on the uh, microphone. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, okay, yeah. Let me, let me change the shot. Okay. I forgot. I, sh I should have told you that earlier. <laughs> no, I, I didn't think about it. I just didn't think about yeah, it. Yeah, no, that's something I, sh I should have told you. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> sorry. So my grandfather uh, was in 1949, the youngest. There were 12 children in my father's family. About nine of them survived. There were two boys and, um, no, three boys, and the rest were girls. Um, and one of the boys died, he was about four years old. He uh, was poisoned um, with something that he ate. Then, so there was my father, who was the third one in line, then Uncle Georges-Amy, who was probably the um, six or seven one in line. And Solange was the baby, so she got yes, so, yeah, okay. Okay, she. Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, I've got. Yeah. Uh, let me let me adjust because you reached down there. Oh. Okay. Need you to backtrack a little bit. That looked that looked kind of funny. <laughs> oh, okay. No, I was something bit me. Oh. Uh, okay. <laughs> and uh, well, Solange uh, got married in 1949, 49 or 50, one of those two years, and my grandfather was going to give her away and uh, it was about two weeks before her marriage my grandfather died of a heart attack and so my father gave away his sister but they still had the wedding but it was a very sad occasion so to go back to my family you know what one meant to be with um, to live with Simon and um, and uh, Rene. My father was a hard-working man, uh, but he also liked to, to drink. And well, I, the, 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 the talk was that he had started uh, when, uh, a young, when he was in college. He was working one summer and he worked for the alcoholic um, division for, this, for the province in, in our town, and he started um, nipping with the other guys around and that's how he got it they claim that maybe that's what started the whole thing but was it true or not we don't know but he certainly enjoyed stopping in the tavern and having a few drinks and uh, now my mother's family they were very enterprising and they were there to make money and so my grandfather had been a farmer when he was in, in northern Canada in you know, northern Bega and eventually he worked for my grandfather, and, uh, but he wasn't making that much money. So my grandmother, Donalda, says, Dalal, we're going to open our own grocery store, a neighborhood grocery store, to La Rue Saint-Paul. And uh, so that's what he did. And that's why he trained his four boys. By that time, my mother's, uh, the three sisters, yeah, there were four boys, uh, four girls, four boys, uh, and two girls. Again, they were a large family. There were ten living children, both sides a large family. And so my mother's sisters, more or less by that time, were married. Aunt Lucille married Eldon Strong, uh, who came from uh, Ross's Point, New York, and Aunt Rita married... Harry Pombrio, who came from uh, 
Uh, oh God. Um, I just forgot. Lake Cham no, just from Lake Champlain. I'll, it'll, it'll come back to me in a minute. And um, the story is that both Eldon had a band, and Eld and uh, Harry used to play the trumpet. And they were often asked to cross the border and play in some of the dance hall in St. Jean. And that's how they met Lucille and Rita. Aunt Yvette came to the United States to visit her in Manchester to visit a cousin, and that's where she met uh, An uh, Andrew or Andy Tutain. So, but Mom was the only one who stayed in Saint Jean. Now, the baby Muriel was only a year older than I was, so I was never considered on that side of the family as a niece, but really as the baby of the family. So Muriel and I grew up together and did a lot of things. And oftentimes, my Muriel would come and visit, would come and play with me, and she would say, "We well, don't listen to St. Thomas. I don't listen to her. That's only my sister. You listen to my mother. So, and so, and I could understand that. It took me a little while to understand that. So, uh, so we had a great time, yeah. So Muriel and I did a lot of fun things together. What was the most fun thing you ever did with her? Ah, uh, well, she was a great, she was, oh, she grew very fast. She was twice my height. And I was always a little shrimp, and uh, but one thing we used to we look we used to love to sing, and we go exploring either with our bikes, or we'd go to um, uh, one of the things that we often did is that Saint Jean as a as a river called the Richelieu River, and part and it also connects to Lake Champlain on one end, and then the other end it goes to the Fort Chambly, and then eventually connects to the Saint Lawrence River. So what, there were a lot of uh, sailboat or pleasure boats on Lake Champlain and a canal was dug out and so they, the canal ran through Saint Jean uh, and they had various locks. And so, well, the, the, the strip of land between the river and the canal was called La Bande um, it's like a strip, I'm not sure I would say that, but La Bande du Canal. And us as kids, we used to walk there a lot, and we'd play there. And um, so I can remember her one day, she says, let's go fishing. And we had this song that we used to sing. And, um, so, and so we would sing these songs in order to catch more fish. What was the song that you remember the uh, most? Oh. I, I know what it is. I can't think of it. It's, I just got a blank. Okay. <laughs> I'll have to think about it later on. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, but also the Lefebvre, um, I had a very, I, I couldn't remember things when I was very young. And my aunt, uh, Gabrielle, my father's sister, had a beautiful voice. She was a mezzo-soprano and um, taught music and was the choir master and uh, and did some, um, uh, there was not really professional, but did some professional things, because I was not accepted for a woman in those days, but that was okay. This type of work is you do it on a very subtle way before you got married. And, but she undertook, and she used to teach diction. And uh, so she, they would, uh, I would go down there and they taught me to, uh, little poems and I could recite them by heart. I was four years old and they had me perform before an audience and I just did it uh, no problem and I had the little the little mice. I had all the colors of the little mice. I can remember that. And but by the time I got to be about five or six years old, I had some kind of a uh, Oops, hang on, sorry, Mama. Yeah, things to right. perform. But it got too much and I got mom mom used to say she she was like night and day. I had like a little depression. Oh, I think of it. And so she had to stop it from, uh, she doesn't know what caused it, but she says, I just stopped being my whole um, <coughs> attitude just changed. It's as if it was like like a depression. Mm. She wasn't sure. And because in those days you didn't, you didn't do anything, something happened like that. And so she says, she refused to have, them, have me do any more uh, 
recital or things like that. <coughs> I'm sorry, it's starting again. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, you know, let me know when we need a break break. Oh. <coughs> I'm going to have to go and get some All right, stuff. Well, and we're going. Great. Okay. Um. <coughs> but I, I mean, you know, I, I just didn't do that sort of thing as much. Uh, it was just... It's when she encouraged me, she encouraged Muriel to come and play with me because she felt that, you know, I needed just to be more, um, not to be pushed by adults, but to have a child playing with me. And so that's why we, we did. The other thing that Muriel and I used to do is we go to the movies. We love to go to the movies. I mean, I just practically, we had three movie houses in St. Jean. One was totally French, one was just English, and the other one was half and half. And um, so Saturdays uh, was normally in the early days before they um, they had they um, they banned uh, youngsters of, to attend the, the theater. But Saturday was like the kids' day, and they always had one movie about cowboys. Then the main feature. Then you have newsreel. And you have a couple of cartoons was really neat. So, and 25 cents, maybe 50 cents, maybe later on. Um, so, Muriel and I, would, what we'd do, we'd pick up bottles. And we used to get two cents for the bottle. And we'd, uh, if we had enough, we'd go get an ice cream cone. And then we'd go to the movies. So, my mother said, that'd be fine. We always brought a lunch with us. But we didn't say only for one movie, we'd say for two movies. Sometimes she had to come and get us because we would have stayed for the third movie. Um, so we did a lot of that. A little dog. And I can remember um, a friend of ours had a, a neighbor had had um, a garden. So we asked them if we could pick up some flowers. And they said, sure. And so we pick up the flowers. And we had, at the time, the onions were just kind of blooming. So we were selling them for two cents so we could get money to go to the movies. <laughs> Itself onions or flour? Well, the, fl well, the tip of the, the onion <laughs> was flour. <laughs> so we sell them. <laughs> so we had some people who would buy them because we were just selling them. Oh, God. I mean, we did do these things. And um, also the other thing that Muriel would say, oh, this is the war. So we had to help the war. And one of the things that, particularly during the, uh, the early years of the, the war, um, uh, like... Um, the, uh, the, the I'm, I'm just forgetting some of those. The uh, the the uh, silver, not the silver. The wrappers in the, in the cigarettes was in silver foil. Foil was not available, and you could not get icicle uh, foil icicle to put in your trees. For, just for Christmas. For Christmas. So we went out and picked up all the cigarettes packages we could find, and in dumpsters everywhere we could find them got home and we on you know and we picked up the foil that for the cigarette and made uh, uh, stand uh, the, uh, the the icicle for our Christmas tree and also if we had any uh, leftover then we would bring them to some areas where they would help if they for recycling so that was one thing that we did um, yeah, little things like that but one thing I did and you were talking about Maybe the worst thing, I don't know, but I had, prior to the fact that when I really had a problem, uh, my mother was not a her, an early riser, so she would sleep late, and so I would often get up before her and take off. I'd roam all over the place, and uh, in a small village, and not far from where we lived, there was a hotel. I had been... No, I had never been there, but they did not know me. And I would go around, and I, one day, I'd just go around and looking at people and talking to them, and I was pretty articulate. And uh, so they said, well, what's the matter? Um, you know, you're hungry? Oh, we, I'm so hungry. And so they said, well, come in and have a bite to eat. And so they finally she said, what's your name? So I told them my name. And one day my father went to, to this hotel, was in the bar, and they said, "Oh, we got this little girl that comes. You know, she's a she's a buffet. Do you know her?" She said, "Get on the face. Yeah, that's my daughter. 
Oh, we said, she comes here the past week. She's been coming here every day for breakfast. We felt so bad. We didn't think she was, she, she, it, it wasn't feeding her. So my mother was so mad and my father was so, when I got home, I'll tell you, I really got a little spanking about that. And you embarrassed them. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I would go around begging, you know, for food. That was okay. I liked it. It was fun. So, anyway, that was one thing I did a lot. And one of the things that uh, we lived, we had somewhat lived, not in the center of town, but not really in, well, yeah, in front in the center of town, and not and right across from the railroad station. So we had two railroad stations in Sejar. We had the CPR and the CNR. And we were across the, the CPR, and we would play uh, a lot at the station or on the tracks. And often they would park the trains on these tracks, and so we would go up there, and oftentimes, um, just just the little kids and my neighbors, and then we'd go up and climb the, um, uh, where the water towers are, so my mother would get a phone call, come and get your daughter, get her down, get her, get her down, she's up in the tower, and uh, so, yeah, yeah, we did a lot of crazy things like that, but one of the things that happened is that I had a little friend, but she lived on the other side of the track. She's about the same age as I was, and her father one day sent her to a store that was across the street to get, it was something like around supper time, and so she did, and she took a chance, the train was coming, and her foot got caught in the track, and she actually got killed. So we were very careful after that, very careful. So it was very, very, very sad, yeah. Wow. Yeah, and... Uh, because there weren't no protection, you know, you didn't have the main lights or anything like that. Uh, you know, what Michael was telling you, yeah, we did crazy things. I walked on those tracks too, took shortcuts to go across to to Iberville and when I went to the camp. Uh, we sort of knew when the uh, the trains were coming, so my mother did not know, we couldn't tell her. So we did a lot of crazy things. And then we had bikes, Muriel and I had bikes, and we go exploring, so, so yeah. What was the most interesting place that you went to explore with your bikes? Um, I'm not sure there was anything exciting, but it's the fact that we were, uh, we could go anywhere we wanted with our bikes. Now, I went to the summer, we had our summer house, uh, or summer camp, and we used to call it summer camp, um, Sark Cottage, and it went about three to five miles, and we bicycled to it every day, and we had to go into town, cross the, the bridge, the Point Berville, and then see we go this way, Point Berville, and then go back up. So every day we do that. And then when I later on, when I started working at the Bell Telephone Company, I would take my bike. I worked here at five o'clock, I did it, and sometimes I did it at night. So what did you do for the Bell Telephone Company? I was a uh, telephone operator. You see, I could speak English. Uh, and that was one of the reasons that I got the job, because I could speak English and understand English. And uh, so that, that, was, that was not a, it was an interesting job. I was making $25 a week, five days a week. <laughs> so I was, and I was 16, I had just turned 16. The, the year before that, um, I quit school and I went to work for Adam Noir, which was a, um, um, a dry goods store, and we worked from nine o'clock till six o'clock, six days a week, and Saturday night till six o'clock, and Friday night till about nine ten o'clock. We had one hour for lunch, we got fifteen dollars a week, and uh, no benefits whatsoever. Now tell yeah. me, what was happening with your earnings? Earnings? I gave it to my mother. That's it. All of it? Yeah. I never kept anything at that time. Just and, gave her everything. And you said, what was happening with your earnings when your mother took it? She just used it for uh, food. I don't know. I never asked okay. her. Just, just for us. It, we just trusted that she was going to take. You know, she, she needed it. That's it. My father never uh, earned big salaries. The salaries are very, very low in those days. Uh, so. My mother made all our, our clothes. She was excellent seamstress. It's a beautiful job. I was, yeah, I, I think I mentioned that to you. 
I was about 14 years old, uh, 12, 14 years old. I had never bought a piece of clothing. She made them all. Uh, the coats, dresses, uh, maybe just underwear was the only thing she ever bought. And so, um, what kind of things, what kind of materials did she use to make some of the clothing? Oh, anything. You know, she make a coat, woolens. She make uh, little dresses, fancy party dress with uh, voile too, and regular dresses with cotton. Um, anything that we would. Was you that told me that she made bathing suits from potato sacks? Oh, that was when she, yeah. My grandmother, uh, when they were in Norembega, uh, they didn't have much money, but they used to buy sugar and flour by 100 pounds. And they came in these big white flour bags, and one of them was a flour or something like that. I forgot the name of the, the flour, Purina, I think it was. I'm not sure. And well, one was a flour. And... Uh, so she saved those and she made bathing suits for the girls. And she says, sometimes a little embarrassed, but there weren't that many people there, but she said, we used to have a big rose on the back, uh, or something like that, you know. But, uh, oh yeah, we were, so, and it was just bleach. They would probably bleach it, that's it. Okay. I have five minutes on this tape. Okay. So I'll be switching. So, uh, okay. so, okay, okay so, all right, so you worked with Bell Telephone. Yeah. And uh, any, uh, you know, I'm going to switch tapes. Yeah. 